This story begins from Anchar Lake, 18 kilometers north of Srinagar city. Anchar is the most polluted and fastest tying lake of the valley. Most of this lake has been converted into permanent land patches for agricultural and other activities. The remaining lake is fast turning into a marsh. Typha elephantina and Typha angustata, commonly called Indian reed mace or elephant grass, grows here in abundance. Locally called pits, this gigantic, gregarious marshy plant, about 3.5 meters high, is found in stagnant fresh and brackish waters of Anchar, Dal and Wula lakes. The leaves of Typha are grass-like, spongy, trigonous and deep green in color. They are very smooth, about 120 to 180 centimeters long and 1.8 to 3.8 centimeters broad. The plant perinates through a thick rhizome, which is Stoloniferous. In Typha, we have rhizome as the perinating body, that is this here. Now, this rhizome normally produces the shoot, now, which in turn produces these leaves, which are used for mat weaving. Now, rhizome in turn, underground also produces these creeping stolons. Now, these stolons travel from the rhizome to a distance of about one feet, and at that distance, they in turn produce another rhizome, that is this one. So it means that one rhizome, if sown at one place, will in turn produce lots of these rhizomes at regular intervals, and which in turn will produce stolons, and this cycle would continue year after year. Now, since uh, this plant perinates through this rhizome and these stolons, we call this type of plant as Stoloniferous perennial, or the plant which perinates through stolons. Though it grows naturally, it is planted in different lakes of the valley for the purpose of commercial exploitation of its leaves and female inflorescence. The female inflorescence is used for polishing of mud walls. The leaves, when dry, are used for weaving mats. The cultivation of typha is very simple. The plant with its rhizome is uprooted from the marsh and planted at another place. After some time, the rhizome develops stolons and rhizomes at intervals. From every rhizome grows a new shoot and the process of proliferation continues. Problem with this typha is that when we plant it, its fibrous roots every year accumulate a huge amount of silt so that the lake continuously is getting shallowed down by the deposition of the silt around these roots and then the free waters or fresh waters or clear waters get transformed into the swamps or the marshlands. The result, lakes turn into marshes and the marshes into permanent land patches. If typha is allowed to grow unchecked in the clean water areas, the lakes will fast turn into swamps. This is the sad part of the story. 
But does the plant have any significance in the overall ecosystem of the lake? Taipa is important, so far we are considering it, that it takes up a lot of nutrients in a polluted water where we have a lot of nitrate, phosphate and potassium. It is a very good uh, taker or it acts as a pollutant seed. And that's why you see the luxurious growth is always there when the nutrient enrichment is there in the water, Taipa grows extensively. But at the same time, if an, a Taipa growing is to that extent, where, inter, where it interferes, the expansion of the, uh, this uh, Taipa is uh, squeezing the open water areas. There it is detrimental, of course. But at the same time, it is a part of the ecosystem. Where I would uh, like to have these patches on the periphery of the uh, uh, lakes, where it will act as a nutrient sink. It is suggested that wherever uh, these uh, Taipa plantations are carried out, those uh, sites should be earmarked simply because if we plant it once in an open area or once in open water, that open water will also get converted into shallow waters and which ultimately will get converted into lands for vegetable and other cultivation. For mat weaving, the leaves are harvested in the month of September, October. The harvesting is done manually and the leaves are dried in erect bunches in open fields. The villagers living around Anchar and other lakes put in a lot of effort to harvest and market the dry leaves of Taifa to supplement their family income. On an average, a family earns from 10 to 40,000 a year. تہٕ پوتس ڈیبری نکھ وٲلِتھ چھِ مےٚ رۄپیَس ژَتجی ساس اَتھ منٛز بَڑان اَتھ پٮ۪ٹھ چھُس پَنُن عیال گُزراوان ییٚلہِ زَن مےٚ تٕرٛہ بٲژ عیال چھُ اَمہِ مٔزیٖد تہِ چھِ قٲلیٖن کٲم تہِ کَران تہٕ نِباوان چھِس وقت مگر قبل از وقت چھُ مےٚ یہِ ژیٚچہِ بیول ییٚتہِ نٔوروومُت ییٚمہِ سۭتۍ عام زٔمیٖندار چھِ وٕنکٮ۪نَس سکوٗنت کَران اَتھ پٮ۪ٹھ مگر یہِ ابتدا چھُ مے نٔوروومُت یہِ اِنشاء اللہ أسۍ کَرو ہمیشہِ تِکیٛازِ اَسہِ چھُ یَتھ پٮ۪ٹھ اَصٕل فٲیدٕ یِوان Truck loads of dried leaves are seen being transported from different areas around Dal Lake, Nagin Lake, Wooler Lake, and Anchar Lake to the local market. <laughs> This market on the banks of Dal Lake is a small cooperative run by 25 members. 
each member has invested rupees 10,000 in the business and expects to earn from 30 to 40,000 a season. They are from different places and migrate here in September, leaving their families behind. They live together in these small boats, cook, eat, and work together for four to five months. The bundles are sold in retail to the mat weavers, each bundle costing from rupees 50 to rupees 60, depending on its size and quality. The weavers inside Dull Lake ferry them to their cottage industry for weaving mats. In the next part of this film, we shall accompany these women to their cottage industries to experience the process of mat weaving and have a glimpse of their lives.